Welcome to the Starting Strength series of interviews. Today we are indeed fortunate. We have with us Marty Gallagher and Ed Cohen. Uh, for me to be talking to Ed Cohen here is like a titty bar DJ getting to talk to Bob Hope. Okay? I just want you to know that I have the proper perspective on this situation. And Ed has come down from Chicago, yeah, Marty's come, come down from Pennsylvania, and thank both of you oh, guys thank you. so thank much you. for coming down and talking to us. Thanks for having us. What we're going to do today is we're just going to talk to Ed. Marty has been friends with Ed for 28 years, and right here is a lot of information. So you guys pay attention. Yeah, I. Uh I first saw Ed lift in 1984 in Chicago. Is that the Chicago? 85. 85. 98? Yeah, 198-pound class. 198-pound class. I was working with Mark Chalet at the time. And Ed, at that meet, squatted 859, benched 485, and without a bench shirt, deadlifted 859, and this was otherworldly lifting. That was a 2,200 pound total. 2,204. And at the time, the world record in the 242 pound class was 2,204. The world record in the 198 pound class was 2,100. The world record in the, in the 198 pound class was 2,050. And here was a guy who not only match John Cuck's 242 pound total record, but Cuck's total record at 242 stood for another 10 years until Ed Cohn moved up to 242 and broke it. And broke that. Okay. <laughs> and it was just mind blowing. Now I was fortunate enough, uh, I remember the first time that I actually coached Ed is we were at one of Larry's meet, I guess that was the next year in 86? Yeah. Uh, I was walking back across the street from the spaghetti factory where we would eat, and here's Ed Cohn waving at me from across the street saying, Marty, Marty, come here. And so, okay, Ed Cohn is summoning me, and he draws me over and he says, you're coaching me tomorrow, Doug can't sh make it. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, okay, great. So. <laughs> the next day, it was the most pressure-packed experience because not only had I not worked with him, I didn't know how Ed functioned. And working with Ed obviously is intense, but he had this bad habit of after the opening attempts in each lift, he would turn to you and say, you pick my next attempt, I don't want to know. Worked for me. Yeah, well, again, <laughs> you, 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 you want to you yeah. you talk about uh, pressure. Uh, so I was lucky enough, I would say the high point of my coaching career, and I had a lot of high points, including uh, coaching the U.S. team to the World Championship in 1991 at Orbro, yeah. Sweden. But I would say the two times that I handled Ed, I handled Ed when he totaled 24.02 as a 219-pounder. I handled Ed when he totaled 24.50. Which mean? The, when in you, Vegas? When you top the all-time. 24.63 in the Vegas. The total 24.63, which at the time exceeded any total done by anyone in powerlifting at any body weight. Uh, so those were absolute highlights of my my career as a coach. What year was that in Vegas? I don't even remember yeah. my years. I remember all the lifts and stuff, but the years just right. kind of fly by. And let's point out something right here. That total was done with equipment that today would be considered laughable. Nothing. Yeah. Well, yeah, but it, you know, uh, at the time it worked for us. It, and it certainly as hell did. I still got a little out of it, yeah. so you know, I'm guilty of that. If right. you know, well, the purest out there, but right. Yeah. But, but the, what I, my point is, the total, that total is not 
equatable to to the same total that would be posted at a at a geared meet now. At, at the time, I pointed this out in our last interview. At the time, he totaled 2,400 uh, in the 220-pound class. It was 14.8 percent ahead of the rest of the world. And I think that there's a strong possibility that it, that is unmatched in any athletic endeavor of any kind to be that far out in front of the rest of the pack. Uh, I'm going to say one more thing, and I want to. Uh, we're actually going to allow Ed to talk a little bit here. <laughs> oh no! But 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 I will say this: in 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 recent years, everyone has been dismissive of Ed's training in. By, by, by using this offhand remark that, oh, Eddie was just a genetic freak. Uh, there's really nothing to be learned from the way that he trained. The fact is, is that Cone's tactical strategies are, in my opinion, the most sophisticated ever devised, and the numbers speak for themselves. No one has come within a country mile of his 900 deadlift at 220, and I don't think it'll ever be exceeded. I'm going to be honest with you. So I think it would be interesting to talk a little bit about the training because no one talks yeah, about Cone's that. training. Everyone wants to talk about his accomplishments, but the training was so scientific, so spot on, and so straight ahead. Uh, the use of the straight line periodization, which has completely fallen out of favor. He, he could go through an entire 12-week training cycle without missing a single pre-planned lift. Now imagine you, you set up a training cycle 12, 12 weeks in advance. And make every single one of the projected uh, see, I, workouts. See, I thought that's the idea is to make all your lifts. Well, it is, supposed to miss, it, but it? most people don't do that. I certainly as hell never yeah, pulled off a 12 week cycle without having to rewrite something. Where did that come from? Yeah. Where did your where did your approach come from? Uh, I read all the magazines all the time and just made my own mistakes. And then you just after time after time after time, I just kind of made my body fit the routine and just busted my ass. That's pretty much all it is. And then mm -hmm. you just know how to pick your numbers and know know your your body positioning at all times in the in the lifts and how it's supposed to feel. Then you, you usually don't miss. It's also a complete lack of training ego. Uh, a, a realistic, a cold, realistic sense of your capacities. Um, let me let me ask you this: uh, When you came up initially with Ernie, right? Uh, actually, by myself, I used to go to. Ernie's when I got a little older on Saturdays and just do my deadlifts. Now, how about uh, 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 Rudy's brother? Yeah, uh, Francis Rudiger. I used yeah. to lift in his garage for a while. Right. Now, wh uh, when when did you come into contact with Doug Furness? At uh, one of the YMCA Nationals around 82. And you guys hit it off immediately. Yeah, he was actually at 242. Okay. And I was at 181. Now. You guys started comparing training notes. Yeah, and, and he, he helped me. He actually helped me out a lot as far as how to set it up to make everything. Right, right, right. Now at the top, go ahead. Our training wasn't exactly the same, but the right. same type of periodization, a little bit different rep scheme and set scheme. Mm -hmm. But it's it all leads up to a certain point anyway. So, and and Doug of course came up under Dennis Wright. Yes, who was squat. Maestro, yeah, he was a great trotter. Um, unbelievably technician. Uh, when did you, how did you, how did you latch, could you explain for a little bit the straight line periodization in the classic 12-week cycle? Let's just start at a higher, higher reps. Typically. And then lower reps no, in the I mean, end. I mean, for the, for the first, you, you would it, classically it, it, break in. Yeah, how many What weeks? do you mean by higher reps? How, eights? It, Tens, eights, Tens. fives, triples, doubles. Yeah, that was all the, the progression. Way yeah, sometimes mm -hmm. my cycles would be longer. Usually a lot longer in the off season because I would make smaller jumps in the off season for strength gains over a longer period of time, and I'd take bigger jumps in the same type of routine, but with knee wraps and a suit. Or I usually didn't put the straps. So I could put them up myself, anyways, mm -hmm. um, till the end, and take bigger jumps to peak out. Now, but, now, but it was just typical yeah, high volume to yeah, and I would I would high intensity. I would follow my assistance exercises the same way. I would I would train them the same way yeah. from 
close grips to inclines to behind the necks to bent over rows to whatever else, I would set them up the same way mm -hmm. to get stronger and peak out at the end the same. So everything did. The, the, the thing is, is you know, you can you can handle that for so many years till you break down as with, with any sport. Mm -hmm. And uh, the idea is that stay healthy. Right. And it, and it worked for a long, long time. Uh, also, the idea of to get as strong as possible in the off season with a minimum of gear. Yes. What were some of your best? In other words, when uh, leading into your 2420 meet in Dallas, what were some of those best off season raw lifts? Do you remember those? Um, the squat was probably a little over eight for a couple reps. With um, just wearing a belt. Yeah. Um, the deadlift with just a belt, I doubled 900. And using conventional? Uh, conventional, I usually would stand on a block. Right. So it was somewhere over eight. Off of for, a? For a double, yeah. Now, was that off the 100 pound plate or off the Yeah, off a 100 pound plate. Yeah, so again, doubling 800. I, get, I know I had benched 550 for a double. Right, right, which we, which we have yeah. on tape. Yeah, that's on a, tape. In a t shirt. Yeah. Uh, but again, and so, so you build up this awesome strength in the off season. So when you rolled into the, the to actual the, to competitive the 12 week season, cycle. Yeah. yeah, a lot of times the cycle wouldn't even be 12 weeks long because I wouldn't go back to doing too many reps because it would burn me out. Because right. my strength was so high at the time that if I went back to doing, using the weight I could right. for the reps, I would just burn out immediately. Right. It would be too high intensity. So I'd usually start back off with fives. For so many weeks, oh, I see before I, in the squat and before I used knee wraps, right? And then I'd work up to whatever with with, with, with just knee wraps, and start putting the bottom of the suit on. And back in those days, you you didn't get a lot out of the squat suit, but you got enough where it kept my my hips were nice and tight. Mm -hmm. And like with the twenty four oh two total, we didn't have we didn't use bench shirts then. Yeah, I never used a deadlift suit, but that's just what you did. Yeah. Uh, also the, uh, well, that's what you did. That was a lot of a lot of everyone did. did that. No, no. What I mean is, I don't know if Ed really has a concept of what he's accomplished. If he thinks that everybody was doing the same thing, this is maybe not the same yeah, weights uh, that I did. No, but. not. But, and I don't know if Marty regards this, but it is the, I, we're sitting here with the greatest power lifter in the history of the sport. Possibly the greatest it, strength athlete of the 20th century. Oh, I don't know about Who else, who else would be in the class? Possibly Alexia, possibly Paul Anderson. You, you got the dimension. No, he, no, I'm sorry, yeah. no, no, we like him. Oh, well, see, I, I, I can't judge that because I know you. I can, can only go we by can. what I could do in powerlifting because I know damn well I could never do any of the, sh the cr stuff that they did in, in Olympic weightlifting, and I'm not going to say oh because I never tried. No, that's that's a bunch of BS. It's a, that's a whole different level of type of stuff. So I only consider myself in powerlifting as doing well like I did. I don't. And that's that's just well, me. You're a, you guys you're a, you're a humble you guy. I don't care. You're a humble guy, Ed. But we know what's going on here. Yeah. Yeah. Fourteen and percent gap. Now, talk, so, talk to us about, I want, I, want, I want him to hone in on the five rep set. Yeah. This is a real important A lot of that concept. was brought to me by Doug. That's the best strength gains you could get right. with sets of five. We thought the five was the best combination yes. between. That's what we got Kirk on. Yes, indeed. Oh. When we changed Kirk around. We changed Kirk After he, he bombed at the Nationals programs. in Vegas. Yep. All of our programs are still based on fives. That's if you get away from your fives, you're getting away. The further away you get from fives, the further away you are from your strength base. And these programs that just emphasize single squats, like for Olympic weightlifting, single squats, single squats. If you don't go into that pretty strong, you're not going to hold it. Yeah, on you're singles. not going to develop that much more strength because no. you're not doing the, the same work. Right. Well, oh, you, didn't, you didn't do any singles anyway. No, not really. Yeah. Just, just at the meet. An occasional miss. That's what the of a double. Yeah. But very. Not rare. really. Not really. I didn't miss. Right. Right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Uh, but again, the five reps. It is interesting because John McCollum stressed the five rep set and his keys to strength. Uh, Cassidy stressed it to us. So when, when I came in contact with Ed and he's telling me that, you know, it's the five and Doug's saying it's the five, it was like, 
Oh, okay. All these great minds. So star, star based all of our training on fives. On the five. Mark Berry, back in the 30s, yep. was probably the first guy to codify that. His fives are the, the basis of this. What was your, can you give us your best all-time fives at 98, 220, and 242? Come on. Probably not. Come on. Um, in the squat with the straps down with yep. one of the old-time suits, it was 900. For five. For five. Wayne. That was around 236. Okay. Uh, at, at, at 220, I don't know. I would say it was a, it's definitely a, a mid eight. Mm -hmm. At 98, I couldn't even tell you. Right. Couldn't it's even tell so you. So old now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All blends you, together. Do I have this right? I'm bad with statistics, but you have world records in four different weight classes. Well, I had to. Is that correct? I, I had a, I had a, a a world record exceeding deadlift at, at 181, which was 791. Right. Um, and then, you know, 98, 220, 242. World records in four different weight classes. Right. And in three of them, they haven't been exceeded. To this day. Right. So that's... There's always that's, somebody out there. The one, well, the one kid from, from Russia, Balev, is strong as shit. Um, his only problem, like in the deadlift, is uh, I mean, I, I shook his hand. I saw him in England one time, and, and I mean, I got big hands, but I shook his hand, and his hands were like, you know, oompa loompa. They were like this. So that would, you know, I was just lucky enough to have these hands. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, but he's, he's definitely a strong guy. I'm a hair under 5'11, and I, I'm, I'm a normal sized guy. Okay. <laughs> he's tall. Should have been taller. You're tall, you're half tall. <laughs> Come on, don't lie. Five foot six, if I stand on my left leg, my right leg after hip surgery, maybe a little shorter. What's your shoe, shoe size? 12. All right. <laughs> He's got some advantages. Big gloves and big shoes. Yeah. That's yeah. it. Yeah. yeah, big bones, well, big yeah. fat tendons. Uh, what's your wrist size? You're an eight, but not. Don't know. But you're not. He, yeah, it's a. Don't know. He's an eight. Mm-hmm. But he's not Shane Hammond. I never got into measurements no. and all that kind of crap. I mean, I just wanted to sit between you guys to, as, as long as I was in striking distance <laughs> of both of you, so I got long arms. That's why we place the chairs like this. It's not the, that's not the first time or the last time that I'll be slapped by Ken. No. <laughs> so, who have you trained with? Let's talk about training partners and, and, and uh, some stuff you've seen, people you've trained with. Doug Furness. Yeah. Let's, Let's talk about Doug. The funnest. Yeah. Let's That's talk about Doug. Marty and I touched on Doug in our interview last month, and uh, what a guy. What, yeah. a, what a guy. We're, we lost him March of, of March. 2012, just, just this year. We're Age. sitting here in, in, at the end of May in 2012. That this interview is being taped at the end of May. So it was just a couple of months ago that Doug died. Uh, you trained with Doug. You learned a lot of stuff from him. And oh, yeah. You went to meets with him and had a lot of fun. Tell us a little bit about Doug and uh, how he helped you. Oh, well, with, with powerlifting, he helped set up my routine. He taught me how not to miss and how to, how to set it up. Um, Realistically picking your numbers? Yeah. Is that what you yeah. mean by that? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I can tell you a story. One time at a, a meet in Corpus Christi, my main training partner, Emmett, uh, asked Doug to help him pick his numbers, and Emmett had to go for a last deadlift to place or win or show, whatever it was. And Doug leaned down and said, remember, I don't pick numbers for fucking people that miss. <laughs> Scared the shit out of the kid so much, he still talks about it. This. He didn't miss. He didn't miss. He didn't miss. Scared yeah, him into the third. You know, there's certain guys. Marty was good at picking them, fantastic at picking numbers. But, right. you know, you, you, you talk to someone like that, you just, just pick my number that you think you know I can hit. So you got all the confidence in the world, so how can right. you miss? Right. If you trust a guy, how can you actually go out there with a doubt in your head that you're going to miss it? Right. You don't. You right. don't. But yeah, he taught me everything. His form, our forms were different right. in the squat, and because uh, he was straight upright, because he had these monster freaking legs. Yeah. Because he and squatted he had, straight upright. 
Yeah, he had a high bar squat. Yeah. With a, a real quad a, dominant a, kind a of a medium it. stance and just opened up and squatted straight up and down. Could stand there and do a straight out splits and yep. put his head on the floor at 275. <laughs> Consume eight athletes. That's... Saw him do a backflip in Maui, weighing 275. No big deal, not showing off. How long had he been in the sport when he hooked up with you? Well, he was he, he, he played football first at yeah, University of Tennessee. Yeah, he was not in powerlifting very no, long. He was a fullback at University of Tennessee. And then he got a little bit into powerlifting and was in the collegiate nationals. I remember seeing him in the collegiate nationals in the magazine, uh, a picture of him in the magazine. And uh, and then he just took off from there. And all so, of a sudden I saw him at the YMCA Nationals. So in a very, very short period of time, Doug, furnace had accumulated this much experience and wisdom in this sport that well, he was he, able to guide and direct you and a bunch of guys. Well, he learned from Dennis White and some old timers too right. that, you know, worked out in garages and stuff like that to get strung and busted their ass w without fancy machines and, you know, they busted their ass and, and learned from their own mistakes. So that's the best knowledge you can get. Mm -hmm. it, Doug told me, he said that Dennis had him squatting twice a week. And what was it on, on the first day of the week? What was it? A, a, a five, a three, a, I can't remember. A one. They, yeah, five, three, one. Five, three, one. Five, three, one. You'd work up to a big five, then a big three, then a big single. Then he'd have him come back two days later and do five rep pause squats. Ooh. I used to squat twice a week and do yeah. five rep pause squats too on my light day. That's a light day. But right. when you're young, you can do whatever you can, you can get the get crap out of yourself. You can get recovered from yeah. that kind of once they get, craziness. Once, once these guys got up into the eights, Doug said we had to drop the second day. We just yeah. weren't recovering. So that's the other strategic genius of the cone furnace philosophy was that they would hit each lift one time a week. And if, if you hit it with enough intensity and you hit it correctly, you can progress indefinitely. These guys today, we have we have programs out there where they you know they, they train some sometimes some of the Russian programs are recommending hitting a lift up to four times a week. Well, and that might work for somebody squatting five hundred. Right. Well, but if you're squatting eight hundred for five, depends. You, so, you've got yeah. a completely different level of stress being being applied to you in that one workout per week. Well, Marty, so I, 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 don't wanna, I don't want anybody to think that that we're recommending that everybody listen to this, because most everybody listening to this is, a, you know, most of our audience is novices at any given time, because at any given time, most lifters are novices. And that's just the fact of the matter. So once a week is good advice for a guy doing 800 per five, but it's probably not enough work for somebody doing 315. So it is, keep this in mind. It, it can be if that's all they're capable of. Mm -hmm. Now, if I'm capable of doing 600 and I'm only squatting 315, now right. I'm going to have to do more times in a week. You know, the Russians have had a lot of success with their programs, so there's a lot of different programs at work. Sure. The, the, the thing is, is, is what's the workload? What's the recovery? Uh, do they use a lot of equipment? Um, how long do they last? Right. Longevity, but mm -hmm. you know, uh, if Marty and I were talking, if if I can get the same results out of doing less, in a way, right. as far as volume and stuff, why don't you do that? That's I think Jim Wendler's philosophy right. is I want to get the most out of with doing the less least amount I can. Right. There's a, there's a phrase. It's called Occam's Razor. It's a, monk in the 15th century and basically the and I'm paraphrasing is the strategy is, is if you have com two competing philosophies that have relatively equal results pick the one that is the simplest certainly and, and, yeah. and, and, and the, the simplest explanation the simplest. if you hear hoof beats is it horses or zebras right yes right but in, right. in uh, as applied to what we're talking about if you have two competing resistance training strategies uh, and one of them requires the athlete be in the gym six days a week, two hours a day, and the other one requires you be in the gym four times a week for 50 minutes, and they both have equal results, we're going to pick the, less, the lesser, the cleaner, oh, absolutely. the simpler. The most complicated undulating Matt Vayev periodization program 
does not apply to the vast majority of lifters. So yeah. we add five pounds of workout to a set of five. And it, and it works because it's simple. We get some very good results using the very limited approach one time a week with even some absolute beginners. Really? Yeah. It's what you put into it. Right. But the, the, the main thing for beginners is their technique has to be perfectly technique sound all the time. Has to be never lasts. Absolutely. It never lasts. It turns them off right away because they get hurt or it comes too hard. If they hit the, you know, that perfect form all the time and mm -hmm. keep going and they get results that they want to see, which is fast. Yes. And we don't yes. allow them to proceed if the technique breaks down. It's, it's it. Technique is everything. It's tactics and it's techniques. Tactics and techniques. And we have very, we believe that there are technical archetypes. We believe that there are, that, that certain, there are certain examples of squats, benches, deads, overhead presses that are perfect. Uh, I would submit Doug's squat style. Mm -hmm. I would submit, uh, who else? Um, deadlift, certainly conventional. Uh, I don't know, I always liked Gene Bell. Gene had... Because he was in the middle of the road as far as, everything. you know, uh, biomechanics. Stance width, position, everything. Uh, uh, and we were looking at pictures of Eddie Pengelly as far as the sumo, great take yeah. position. Hidaki Inaba, uh, another great one. Benching, uh, we love Kenny Fantano. He's probably the most sophisticated bench approach that we've ever come across. Mike McDonald for oh, a wide grip. Oh, Mike was incredible. Kenny was a closer grip, Bill Sino, a bunch of... Yep, yep. A bunch of guys that were fantastic benchers. Indeed. Back and, then. Uh, into this day because again they're 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 completely applicable because of the lack of gear. Yeah. The power gear changes everything, and and that's the other thing is we feel that the that the cone Furness, Cassidy, Gallagher, Kurwaski strategy we all used it, mm -hmm. it back in the day, all of us because that was that was the state of the art. It's still I mean if you just want to get bull strong. Yeah, it would be hard to find a better, more effective system, completely applicable for today. Can you detail that real quick? Let's let's hear it. Spell it out. It's just. It was pretty much what we talked about there with the periodization. Just what I did, like I told you, I I even periodized uh, periodized my uh, assistance work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Same way. On my heavy stuff. And Eddie, would so, you do, so tell, tell him like a like, like the leg day. I mean, you wouldn't just squat. You'd have no. I do uh, like high bar, close stance, pause squats afterwards. Mm -hmm. After finish squatting, off, now he's finish off right. with a little leg this extension. This is back off stuff. Yeah, for... leg extension, leg curls for balance, calf work. Mm -hmm. I got the calf work thing from Larry Kidney, actually. Yeah. And um, Larry Kidney. Yeah. yeah. Great two seventy five yes. pound lifter. He he. Uh, I'm remembering maybe something wrong. A 722 squat at the oh. age of 62. Yeah, well, oh, yeah. Least, he was an older yeah. guy. I think his best squat was around was close it? to nine, yeah, high he, eight, yeah, nine. Yeah, he was high eights, it's mid not eights. Nine. Good bencher, not so good deadlifter, but yeah, Larry, okay. Larry was great. Uh, t uh, Ed, describe how you would, uh, after in, on your bench day, what would be your assistance work that you would do after working well, I'd, up to I'd you? actually follow the same reps and go, and do close grips afterwards, right. inclines. No, no, would you, did you do the, the too wide, too narrow? Yeah. No, I didn't do, I did, I did wide grips was on my light day. Right. Just okay. the more stretching out. So you'd work up on bench day, you'd work up to whatever. Let's, was say, it was, let's say it was fives. Yeah. I do two heavy sets of five, two heavy sets of five close grips, but I'd pause them. Two heavy sets of five on inclines. Yep. Heavy ass dips and tricep work. Yeah. Then on the light day, would just be light sets of eight to ten. Yeah. My feet up in the air, wide, real, real wide grip. Right. Um, flies and heavy behind the neck presses and a little bit of other shoulder work. Now in the behind the neck press, Ed did 400 for one and 350 for five. Oh no, uh, 350. I don't even know what the what the reps were, but oh yeah, at least. At least. But so there's only, guys that are really good at doing. I've seen some big behind the neck presses. So. I mean, that was, was big with those. He'd wasn't he? Do them standing. I didn't have enough bulk to actually do them standing. God. Well, we'll but take, there's some we'll guys. Take, Scott Smith done a lot of weight like that, but I was happy with what I did. They worked for me. Now, how about back day? 
after working up to the big, let's take it back the to sumo day. When I would be doing sumos, I would actually stand on a block anywhere from uh, one to three inches and do heavy conventional work afterwards. Yep. Then stand on a block and do heavy bent over rows. Yep. And then heavy regular wide grip chin ups with, with weight. How much? 100. Yep. Or lots of reps. sets and reps, yeah. Yeah, and then and heavy ass shrugs. Heavy, what's heavy ass shrug? Uh, my best with a regular deadlift grip, um, no straps, when I was at 198 was uh, 765 for 15. It's out of the rack or off blocks? Off, just off took the it off pins. the rack. Off and the pins. pins. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and you, we, we, you were big in the, the bent over row. What was yeah. some of your row poundage? Um, 573 for two. That's good. That was in myself and Brian Schoonfeld, the strongman, who used to kind of have a contest, so he could push me on a few two. exercises. I'm sure you used straps. With that, yeah. Yeah. But I've done like 440 for eight with no straps. Yeah, right. Would you say that most of your deadlift tonnage that you accumulated over your career was sumo or conventional? The conventional made everything possible with sumo. Right. Because I used a lot of back in my sumo, and uh, so all the, the conventional the, the, work so definitely helped. Deadlift out. was based on conventional training. Yeah, and I'd go with a fairly close sumo, but mm -hmm. you know, when I grabbed the bar, took all the slack out of the bar, I would just keep wiggling in until I just found that right spot that was locked in, and you felt like like right. bouncing a rubber ball off the ground, like it was just. Gonna, Right. Pop up. And tell them how you would save your sumo. What do you mean? Well, you'd save it for the last. Oh, yeah. I would never do that much in training. Just I would, I've only deadlift like sumo like six, six training weeks before the meet. Bridges told Star that essentially the only time he sumoed was at the meet, that all of his, all of his deadlift training was conventional and that he'd warm up the sumo and a warm up for him to go out and do it at the meet. Yeah. Don't know. Yeah. Uh, Ed worked up to some some big conventional deadlifts and if he worked that conventional up, the more he'd worked it up, the higher his jump off point would be when he shifted over to the sumo. Mm -hmm. So that again was a strategy and this went on for years and years and years. The other thing about Ed is his longevity uh, you did your first nationals when? 1983. You did your last major meet when? 19 or 2007. You do the math. I can't. I can't even figure it out. It's a long time. There's with so many. Short My first meet though was 1980. Right. As a 165er. A real light 165er. Actually, the squat racks didn't go long enough there to take the weight <laughs> off the racks and put it on my back. What did you do? Do you remember? 485. It took me three tries to get it because it was it was all wiggling all yeah, over. Yeah, yeah, because the they had to set it on my right. back. Right. And uh, Ernie and Bill Sino were there. It was like a class three novice. Right. And when it, when there was only one federation at the right, time, the, the USPF. USPF. Class four, three, I got, two, I benched, one. I benched 295 and I deadlifted 495. Uh, Doug, Fren 165. Doug Furness told me the, the first time he saw Ed, you were at, you were still, you were trying to make 65s, but you were a little uh, I was heavy. At, I was at the, uh, no. The Ys, was, it was at the Ys, right? I was a 181 pounder. A 181, but it was at the Ys. Yeah. And uh, after the meet was over, Doug said, we were talking to each other in the ride, ride home, and, and so the conversation came, who impressed us? And Ed said, uh, Doug said, oh, you know, the one who impressed me the most was that little pasty white boy. What was his name? <laughs> that was I didn't even remember his name. The little, the little pasty, little pasty white, boy. white boy. Yeah. Uh, what, what, did, uh, what did Gene Bell say about you and the... Willie Bell. Willie. He said, I put baby powder on my legs when I deadlift to get color. That's how white I was. <laughs> he was blue. Probably pretty close. <laughs> I'm Irish, so what do you expect? Yeah. yeah. Hard Irish. So, who after Furness did you train with? Not a lot of top guys. I just sure. had regular guys in the gym that did, were pretty good lifters. My mm -hmm. one, you know, buddy Emmett did pretty well, and um, just a bunch of regular guys. Right. No one like close to me, but they all wanted to train. We had a big, good group of guys. Yeah. Where did you train? Quads gym mainly. Mm -hmm. And I trained at Francis Rudiger. He was a really good lifter back when. 
and he still does do some masters lifting and uh, trained in his garage for a while, which I liked. Right. You know, his brother was Rudy. Oh, the movie. Yeah, the movie oh, yeah. Rudy. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. And um, so when, I, when I got better, I, I went to Ernie's on Saturdays, and I would do my, my whole deadlift workout, you know, sumo, conventional, all my assistants work, and everyone there, you know, he'd have everyone from, from himself to Bill Sino, to Dennis Reed, to all these other really great guys good, coming in, good, and they all do their squats, benches, deadlifts, and I would just come and do my one little workout with all this assistant work. And never got tucked in. How anywhere. far was Ernie's from your from your normal uh, gym? About an hour. So you just drive over there yeah. on Saturday. Is yeah, Quad really. still there, the same location? Yeah. And it's a There's two of them. One one on the south side, one in the city. All right. The one on the south side obviously is a, a little more hardcore. That's the one you train in. Yeah, pretty much you you know, gotta be a cop or a felon to be able to get into that. <laughs> right. Sounds like Chalet's place. Huh? Indeed. Yep. Indeed. Indeed. Uh, also, Ed, let's bring up a couple names and uh, go ahead. Go ahead. No. Um, the name game. Go ahead. All right, here we go. Larry Pacifico. Um, when did I first meet Larry? I met Larry at my first nationals in 1983. Right. He brought in John Topsiglu, and he said, this guy's going to be doing great to Ernie. Um, and unfortunately, I missed weight uh, that night or that next day by one pound, and so I had to go 181 later on. But uh, and he turns to Larry and goes, well, see this little guy right here? He's going to do more than that. And Larry was like, yeah, right. I was 19 at the time. I was trying to make 165. I did everything yeah. imaginable to try to make weight. Never went to sleep. Made the bathroom into a sauna. Even took <laughs> diuretics at the time. And I had an ass like Rich Gasperi. It was like shredded. <laughs> and I weighed in at like 166 little, little and, stripes and a half it. or three quarters. Oh, so God. just missed weight by a pound. And then uh, two hours later, when I weighed in for the 181 pound class, I was already 177 plus. <laughs> And Pacifico said at the time, he said it didn't look, uh, I forget what you were, what you were deadlift, what you deadlifted. 727 that day. He said, that would have been the world record at, one, at 165, too. Yeah, if he'd made weight. If he'd made weight. Yeah. Larry, Larry yeah. at the time said he looked at this kid, this pasty-faced, skinny-ass kid. He Again said, with the he pasty said, stuff. He said, he said that, that kid keeps coming up. He said, that kid can't roll 727 across <laughs> the, the platform. Floor. <laughs> he, he couldn't roll it, and then he, then he pulled it. I squatted uh, 699, bench 429, and that was that we didn't have shirts then, mm -hmm. and uh, lifted 727. So that was Larry. That was Pacifico. Huh? How about... Um, Let's see, who else was strong in that period? Joe Ladmere. He was like my age, too. He was a freaking monster. He was scary. Yeah. He was scary. Taller guy than you. Well, everyone well, was. everybody is. Right? Everyone was. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I saw him. He was at that Nationals, too. He was at 220. I think he told like 2110 or something oh, that day. That's right. Set the world record. Yeah. Yep. Tied. Him and Fred Hatfield went to Worlds, and Fred ended up beating him at Worlds somehow. Yep. Yep. Yeah, Joe did. Wow, he Joe was did, big. Oh, he was a monster. He, we thought that we thought that that Joe was going to match Ed all the way through. He was that that much of a protege at age nineteen. He was a monster. Right. So how long did he lift? Joe's still around. Yeah, he still lifted, but nothing just, like really. He's he blew out his knees a couple times, I yeah, think, or something. Just got injured. And yeah, brought that to. Yeah, still looks really good. Amazing talent, amazing talent. Yeah. All praise to Joe Ladner. Uh, Shane. Shane Hammond is one of the nicest guys you could ever meet in the sport. Now I shot Shane weighing 325 in Philadelphia, do a standing back foot. Yep. And land I've away. seen him do it at yeah. 365. Yeah. He's yeah. What a nice guy. I talked to him amazing, not too long ago. Amazing. What a nice yeah. guy. Yeah, we love Shane. Shane never did as much as he could have in powerlifting, but. He proved himself yeah. in the strength world. Great guy. Going He's over to the, Olympic weightlifting. The first one of these interviews we did, I called Shane, and he drove down from Tulsa to do this interview with me. And he's just a great. He's always been a friendly, mm -hmm. wonderful gentleman. Did he open up? Yeah, he was. He yeah, was. He was count on him I thought so. You guys be the judge. Guy. Read the. You know, watch the interview and see right. what you. Yeah, he answered everything. He's. You know. A great fucking guy. I just was yeah. love it. You yeah. just you know everybody that knows that guy loves so it. So athletic. 
a so, 38 inch vertical from what I understand yeah, and that's yeah. obviously the the backflip shows you yeah. that but I the guys at that body weight giant vertical explosive amazing athlete amazing talent now, Shane it's, I don't know if he was pulling my leg but he used to say that he would do his, I asked him, I said, do you do any cardio? Because you, you, you were in good shape. He says, oh, yeah, I do cardio. I said, well, what's your cardio? He says, oh, I put a corn cob in my back pocket and have my pot belly pig chase me around the farm. Like, <laughs> he used to be a good golfer, too. Yeah, a scratch golfer. Yep. Yeah. yeah, I'd heard that. I'd heard that. In fact, I think I heard it from him. He, well, let's see. Who else? He won't lie. No. Oh, no, he's not no, capable he's, of it. He's, no, he's not a, capable of it. He's a good Christian. Uh, Fred Hatfield. Yeah, I was gonna. I, saw, was, I met him first in, in 1983, also. But uh, and I used to go out when I when I used to do some stuff for Muscle and Fitness and Joe Weider. I used to go out there and stay with Fred all the time. Yeah. And uh, no matter how crazy you used to think any of his writings were, or him as a person, he tried everything he wrote about. Yeah. And he was the first one to use all the speed stuff with the Russians when him and Dave Kage went over to Russia. Right. And Dave learned a lot, or Fred learned a lot over there. Yep. Kazmaier. Well, well, wait, I want to talk, oh, you want to talk more about one, one, one thing about Fred. You remember in uh, when Larry had the big showdown with Cash and he had in the 220 pound class, Larry made his comeback. So you had Larry, you had Fred. You had Cash. That was in 1985 at the Nationals. Yeah. And Jim Cash. Was yeah, all, all lifting in the same class. Fred sets a world record in the squat, 881 and places third. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Jimmy Cash, Jimmy Cash pulls 837 at 220. It's the second best pull ever, right? Only this, only this guy ever exceeded that to this day. Um, yeah, and Jim Cash was a monster. Great physique. Uh, great lifter. Great lifter. Uh, how about Cass? I know that's your favorite of yours. He was in 1983. That was his last, last Nationals. Right. And uh, I was scared to death of all of him, all those guys, him, John Gamble. Okay. They were huge. I was just a little kid. I was scared to death of those guys. But Kaz ended up being a pretty cool guy. This is a monster. He's Kaz. Yeah. We One saw name. him. At the, the 83 Nationals in Austin. Yeah, that's the one I'm talking about. Yeah, he was. Uh, that's the year that I took my national referee test with Lyle Schwartz. Oh, Lyle, I like Lyle. And uh, Chicago guy, guy Northwestern yeah. University. And uh, we had to. Me and another guy were taking our test there. We're sitting there at the table doing our version of the judging, and Schwartz is. We have to agree with Schwartz like 90 percent of the time. Were you it was, it was, yes, it you was an actual flunk. test. That's right. And uh, so I get through with that, and I'm backstage. And I think that the next uh, session is uh, is is the is the supers. And Kaz is is backstage, and. This is when uh, Chip McCain was the meat director for this thing. And Chip, McCain, Chip McCain had hired Ferrigno, had hired yep. Lou Ferrigno to pose. Yes, pose. If you remember this, Ferrigno shows up weighing about 240. Yeah, it was a little smaller than he, he used to be. He was smooth. He hadn't even shaved. And he comes out and he does 60 seconds. And all the kids in the audience yeah. are there to see the Incredible Hulk, and he, so they do a standing O and everything. And he comes back out and does another 30 seconds, takes the microphone, says 10 or 15 words, kind of, and, and then leaves. Yeah. And, and I'm standing backstage watching this. I think, if, if I remember correctly, it was between, this occurred between the bench and the deadlift or something like that in that session. But it had interrupted the flow of the deal. And I'm standing backstage, and I happen to be standing about six feet away from Kazmaier, and he's, he's just up there shaking his head. And if you remember the guys in that, in that session, that time, there were, in that session, there were like, oh, there was like 30 kilos between the top 10 guys in that weight class. Which weight class was just, was it? It was the supers. Yeah, Doyle and Kennedy, Paul Wren. All these these Cash. mastodons are back there, yep. and, and, and Kazmaier's shaking his head and just kind of laughing under his breath at Ferrigno, and uh, he said, uh, 
you know, this is, I said, this is quite a shame they spent the money on this. And then he said, yeah, it could have been much better used to bring the last year's champions of this meet and pay their way, right. which is what should have happened. And that was his comment on the thing. But he, I mean, he didn't say anything nasty about Lou, but it was, the, the whole thing was ridiculous. It was just a ridiculous deal to try to get the, the gate up. And I understand why Chip did it, mm -hmm. because he wanted to try I to make the meet break I still see Ferdinand here and there at the... Arnold Classic. I mean, he still looks good. Yeah, he's probably looks better now than he did back then at that contest. <laughs> yeah, we, yeah, yeah, I'm sure he did. He didn't look very good that day. He I'll, really did. I'll tell you one one good Kaz Cone story. Uh, what was the year that we you did the 2463? No, that was in Vegas. So what year was that? 96? No, I don't think so. That was uh, it was in Dallas. What was that? What was that year? We Dallas, were you about? said ninety one. I can't remember. No, that, that, no, that, that was twenty four oh two. Yeah, yeah. The twenty four sixty three was like ten years later or something. Right. right. Well, anyway, so I show up at the meet at the last moment. I missed the flight. Oh, Vegas. Uh, it was Vegas. Vegas, and I walk yeah. in. Two thousand or something. Two thousand one. Two thousand. I literally come from the airport cab to the meet site. Eddie is taking his first warm up. I go over to him and he starts warming up for the squat. And then Kazmaier walks in, stands against the wall, and he's obviously watching Ed as he's warming up. And all of a sudden, it's like Ed's whole game went like whoop, up to this <laughs> another level. And let me tell you, when Ed came out for that third attempt squat with 1,000... 19. 1,019. That was in Dallas. And he, I have never seen a heavy squat move that fast. And he squats it. It's just one of those days. Just, well, <laughs> one of those days because Kaz was sitting yeah, over there Kaz, watching yeah. you. Your idol was yeah. over there watching you. And I turned to Kaz as we're walking off. And I said, what you think of that, Kaz? He says, that was the best goddamn squat I have ever seen in my life, period. Did you see how low he took that? I had a bunch of my crew uh, there from Quads. Milanovic was Tommy, still there. Oh, man. Oh, that was the best. And the whole, it elevated. Kaz's presence just elevated everything. Mm -hmm. And when he came out for that final deadlift, which would, at the time, exceed the most that any power lifter had done at any time, regardless of weight class, and it was just a foregone conclusion. He just ripped that thing to lock out. Kaz was like, he was so happy. Kaz was so happy. It was yeah. like, my son, you have, <laughs> you have succeeded. But I, I'm so oh, convinced God. that Kaz's presence just took it. Oh, yeah, he made up an award that they just to give me. Yeah. He came with, yeah, it was pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, that, that was, was nice. That, that was a great Kaz story. All right, uh, let me think. We'll think of one, 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 one final name that we haven't touched on. Why don't you come up with one, Chief? Let's see if I even oh, met him. Oh, God. Probably too old for what you come up with. Um, no, I... How about... Uh, how about Dave Kage? Let's. There's a name. <laughs> there's a name that most of these people will not remember at all. No, I mean, he, let's, he, let's he was a lifter at the time, and he was, he was a, a coach with Fred. In uh, 1985 in Finland, he was our he was our coach, and he was crazy too. A lot of fun. They took me out to a, a casino bar before, and tried to make me drink whiskey with them, and I, I don't drink, <laughs> so it was a, it was a mess, and I couldn't get into the casino part because I didn't have a collared shirt on. So Dave Kagey Kagey grabbed a waiter that was walking by and bought the shirt off his back and <laughs> made me wear it so we could all get in. It fit? Yeah. It's a big guy. God. I, I, actually, I used to I hear about... One, I actually thought of one final name. Okay. Well, I, I, I used to hear about Keggy a lot. And it just... I quit hearing it. I'd read his articles. You got to know a lot of uh, construction and real estate and stuff like that. He just moved away from the... So he's still in California, I'm sure. He was a good friend with Fred. Yeah. 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 Kirk. Kirk's out of his mind. <laughs> um, yeah, we're... 
Yeah, we need to talk about Kirk. I've seen. <laughs> you could never the, ever. The pictures ever. of you guys in the convertible with the tiger, wild animals and shit. That's just. You could never count Kirk out and say he wouldn't win or miss a lift. Just could never do it. Kirk, whatever he picked, he usually made, no problem. Except if you know he'd make the deadlift, but he'd drop it at the top. That right. would be the only problem. But uh, yeah, he was a great champion. Enormous legs. And then after the meet, I could just, hopefully he had diplomatic immunity yeah. if we were overseas. <laughs> he, Kirk, was the, Kirk was the Keith Richards of power lifting. Yeah, yeah. He was pretty, uh, he, was, he was out of his mind. I remember the first time Ed in saw or met Kirk. I told him, I said, I'm going to bring this kid in that I've been working in, working with. And at the time, Kirk was sort of a, a misshapen 242 pounder. His upper body looked like it should be like on a good 198, or his lower body looked like a 275er. We called him T-Rex because he had little short <laughs> arms. Little short arm. And little short fingers. So, so Kirk was walking in toward Ed, and Ed looked at him and goes, "Look at the legs of this kid." Because the first words ever came out of Ed's mouth. And we had to work on Kirk. Ed and I, I had this, I had this cushy job back when I was actually working real, real jobs. Where we talked for an hour. Oh God, three, three or four times a week, just talk. Yeah. And we, we would devise. I would feed back to him. Well, here's what the kid did this week. That's what we called him, the kid. We didn't even give him the name. It didn't matter. <laughs> and and Ed wasn't qualified to have a name. No, he wasn't. He didn't name. deserve it. No. And he was bombing out, and doing crazy stuff, and you know he was being wild. And, and Ed and myself, it was like Ed's advice filtered through me onto Kirk, and I would always invoke Ed to get Kirk to do what he didn't want to do. To get do. his attention. No, to get right. him to do what he right. didn't want to do. Kirk always wanted, like anybody else, he wanted to play to his strengths. Oh, mm -hmm. let's squat. No, actually, let's not squat. Let's deadlift. Let's get your stupid 405 bench press up to something where you can actually mm -hmm. be competitive. Mm -hmm. And we took Ed's strategies uh, and, and applied them to Kirk. And the, the guy, I mean, say Took what? off. He just went. Well, wild. if you look at the, the, the cadet, the captain, video you'll notice all of that work is just a straight we, we broke pyramidal his, progression we, we broke his squat technique down to zero mm -hmm. which was this extremely ego bruising for oh him. that's so frustrating i gotta do that now on some things yeah. because was, of the surgery was, he, yeah Kirk, yeah. Kirk, Kirk was squatting time world, off. world records at the adfpa of course they were this high mm -hmm. you know they were passing them we said that's not going to fly over at the uspf he bombed out. Yeah, we had real hard judging back then. Oh, yeah. So, but Ed, Sometimes too yeah. hard. I remember it was. All praise to The squats to were Ed. real, there's no doubt. Yeah, all praise to Ed. And, and again, he, he really was responsible for everything that, that Kirk achieved. Uh, and again, it was, it was the, 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 the cone training template. Any, well, other, a, any other names? Who else? Well, You're the man with the names. We can go down. We can go down the list. John Black and the Blacks boys. <laughs> yeah. Hoss. That was a team. Definitely the now, wild bunch as they used to That was a so. team. My God. Yeah. We, Marty and I talked about them last time. I saw you see them at the YMCA Nationals. Oh, man. They were crazy. In the best well, way. they'd come Jack's in. Jack's Ideas. Gary the damn team the trophy boss. every year. Boss. Steve Wilson. Yep. There's two Wilson brothers. Waddington. Yeah. Dave. John. Say what you will about John. He was John, strong. John had a 775 deadlift weighing 198, looking like he could clean 135. Yeah. <laughs> oh, he was just. I know his squat was good. I don't know if his deadlift was that high, yeah, but was, I know his squat was. No, Eddie was. It was yeah. 775 at 198. Just looking so skinny. Um, yeah, these guys were amazing. George went out, relocated out there. To, to George Hector relocated yeah. out to train at Blacks. Now we'll verify this from George because I heard this secondhand. Yeah. The story is is that he went out for one training session, packed all his stuff up, and moved back to Maryland. <laughs> Why would that have been? Well, we'll have to ask George. <laughs> well, the, the wild bunch for a reason. Yeah. Well, George, there's a good name. Yeah, for I was I was myself and Salaria were his roommates for the '85 Worlds in Finland and. Uh, that's when he was really big. 
And when he got down to 242, I've never seen such an incredible physique and no stretch marks, no loose skin. Phenomenal and still pulled like a 826 deadlift or something. Even his head and, strong. Yeah. Yeah. Really. Forearms, nice guy. Gaps. Oh, God. Now, you've talked to George in recently? Not a long, oh. long, long, long time. I've talked to him every couple of years. We just talk on the phone for a few minutes and touch and base. How's he, he's how's he's he great. He's great. He's not involved in the sport anymore right. and seems reluctant to, he's probably to get that off. way. <laughs> well, he says, when I train, I hurt. When I don't train, I don't hurt. You know, and he's involved in his family and stuff. But, but uh, well, it's, it's what hard a great to, lifter George it's, was. It's, My it's hard to just train like a regular guy right away. Because you, you remember you, all yeah, the... Yeah, you, 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 you have to have a goal, so you right away start a routine where you're kind of periodizing it, you know, to get up and get bigger and stronger right away. And you push that hard, you get sore, you yeah, hurt. It's, it's got to be a goal. Right. And what's the point to George now? How do you be a regular guy? You know, how do you go back to just being a regular guy in the gym Why don't we ask when you, you were George I'm, I'm not a regular guy. I'll never be a regular guy. Well, what are you doing now? I just uh, want to be a little bit... Uh, a little bit of who I was. That's all I care about now. Well, tell us about your hip. I got a new one. Feels okay? There's no pain, no nothing. It's I can go below parallel in the squat. I can squat 700 right now with just a belt below parallel. Go no fake hip. So don't use the fake hip situation as a... It was an excuse. As an excuse for anything. You know, and we I all still, know better than and that. I still would like to get up to 800, but, you know, we'll see. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of tired and beat up from all the years, but... Mm -hmm. uh, I got to see if my confidence come back, you know, if I get my balls back again right. to be able to want to do it. Mm -hmm. But that's all it is, and, you know, I know I can, but I don't know if I want to yet. Right. Now how about your other lifts? My, my shoulders have been sore, so I got to start some new bench stuff. I mean, I can always bench over four. Right. And uh, with, the, with the hip thing, there's a little bit of a deadlift issue of, of balancing out everything, but that's coming back. I, I could still pull over seven nice. with no belt. Right. Um, so I just, you know, just want to be a little bit. So you're totaling yeah. 18 right now, aren't you? Oh, I could total well, raw. I could do yeah. yeah. But I haven't started right yet. Now. I, don't, I don't say that because that would put a, a limit on what I do, and I, I right. can't. I don't put limits on there. Where's right. your body weight? 225 or something. Yeah. So 225 and abs. And next year, how old? No, this July. How old? I'll be 49. Oh my God. Well, he's Ed Cohn. And I look way ah. better than you guys. That's King all I care about. <laughs> <laughs> well, we appreciate you guys being here. Thanks I for coming down. I appreciate you having me. Thank you very much. And I uh, can't thank you enough. Can't thank you enough. And thank you guys for watching us on our Starting Strength series of interviews. Thanks.